And so next we turn to the view from the administration and the U.S. Department of Energy. Jigar Shaw is currently director of the Department of Energy's Loan Program Office, but many of you may know him as a venture capitalist and energy visionary. He most recently was co-founder and president of Generate Capital, where he focused on helping entrepreneurs accelerate cutting-edge decarbonization solutions. Jigar was one of the first to see the true potential of hydrogen, and he helped build plug power into a hydrogen success story. He also founded Sun Edison, a company that was an early pioneer in new models of solar financing. Jigger, it's great to see you again. Thanks for having me. This is great. I really want to thank you for giving me this forum and this opportunity to, to talk to all of you, and thanks for bringing all of us together. Uh, the Loan Programs Office uh, it has been in place since 2005, uh, when it was created by the Energy Policy Act of 2005 by Senator Pete Domenici. I think when you think about the role that it has played, uh, it is sometimes overlooked uh, around how much of a catalyst it's really been. Uh, when you think about some of the success stories that it's had over time, uh, it invested less than $5 billion into early solar and wind projects. Uh, and today, uh, since those uh, projects have been approved, over a trillion dollars has been invested into utility scale solar wind projects uh, using very similar models to what we approved in 2010 and 2011. The same thing is true for Tesla. When you think about uh, the critical loan that the Loan Programs Office supplied uh, early in its, uh, in its most important uh, period of its, of its time, uh, over a trillion dollars has now been invested into the electric vehicle supply chain and electric vehicle manufacturing uh, space since uh, we made that investment. So when you think about the catalytic impact that the Department of Energy hopes to play, it's quite substantial. Today, the Department of Energy's Loan Programs Office has over 130 uh, folks who work in our office, uh, both DOE employees and contractors, we have $46 billion of remaining capacity. Uh, this is uh, spread across renewable energy and energy efficiency, uh, nuclear power, uh, fossil energy, and uh, the Advanced Technology Vehicle Manufacturing Program, which is where electric vehicles, and battery manufacturing, and critical minerals uh, is covered. And then we separately have $2 billion in the Tribal Energy Loan Guarantee Program. The goal of the Department of Energy's Loan Programs Office, as I described earlier, is to really be a bridge to bankability. When you think about what the commercial sector really wants to fund, they, yes, they want to fund things where they're going to make a compelling rate of return, where they're going to make uh, their money back over time. They don't necessarily want to be first in line to invest in innovative technology. But the other harsh truth of the matter is, is they also want to be able to do a deal over and over and over again. So they don't really want to do one good deal. They want to make sure that that good deal is also uh, spread over a number of projects over time so they can leverage the fantastic learnings that they have from the first project into more. And so as a result, there are many technologies from green and blue hydrogen to carbon sequestration and storage to many others that frankly just are not that compelling to the commercial sector. And so when you think about the role that our office plays is really in getting that first, second, third project funded. And then we hand them off to the commercial debt markets where we believe that they would be better served. On hydrogen, what's interesting is that we've been at this for a long time. The hydrogen industry is $120 billion a year business. It is not a startup business. It is something that's been around for a very, very long time. Now, the vast majority of hydrogen is produced directly from fossil fuels, directly from natural gas in particular. Uh, but there are many approaches that have been used for decades. For instance, green hydrogen by electrolyzers was used commonly by Norway uh, starting in the 1940s and 50s. Today, that technology is quite cost competitive. You can generate power, sorry, generate hydrogen from that technology at six to $7 per kilogram. And as the secretary announced with the Earthshot Initiative, we have a pretty direct pathway to getting below $2 a kilogram and approaching $1 a kilogram by 2030. 
And so when you think about all of the resources that we're putting into this and all the resources that have already been invested, remember we had a big focus on hydrogen in the early 2000s uh, from the Department of Energy and a lot of those research grants have really borne fruit. So our office today is, has received uh, three big applications and, you know, and those applications are being considered and, and under due diligence. And so we'll see which ones get through the office. But we're starting to see a lot of commercial activity uh, in the hydrogen space. And so the real question is, what's the point, right? What's the point of pursuing hydrogen? Because I think a lot of folks are unsure around whether hydrogen is essential to the decarbonization vision of the president. And there, I would say that we're not, we're not unclear here. When you look at hydrogen being a $120 billion industry today, just decarbonizing the existing $120 billion industry is a massive opportunity, not only for decarbonization, but also to create jobs in the United States of America and deploy the technology that we invented uh, over the last few decades. The other thing that we, we should talk through is the essential nature of hydrogen. So when you think about the $120 billion business today, hydrogen is used, yes, in the oil refinery business, but also in producing ammonia, also in producing essential chemicals. There are many applications for hydrogen, not just as a long uh, duration storage technique. I think there are many folks who get confused that what we're really going after is producing hydrogen from solar and wind, which are often variable renewable energy resources, and then returning that power back to the grid. But in fact, what we're seeing are business models where you remove the excess power that may have been curtailed uh, otherwise because uh, the, the power is being produced when power prices are low or power prices are negative. Um, but instead of actually returning that hydrogen back to the grid, a lot of that hydrogen is actually being diverted into these other essential services like ammonia, like chemical production, et cetera. And so what you're really seeing is that when we have an excess of electricity generation capacity in this country, we would be producing hydrogen at low electricity prices and then selling that hydrogen into other industrial markets. The other opportunity that we have is co-products. So there are many companies who have figured out ways of uh, breaking up methane in much more environmentally friendly ways into carbon and hydrogen. And so now you've got carbon, which you can sell into carbon black markets, you can sell into other markets, but then you have very low cost hydrogen that comes out of that process that can be made into these other processes. And then the last large uh, uh, area that we're seeing a lot of enthusiasm in, in is, is co-firing hydrogen into natural gas plants. And so when you think about what that looks like is you're looking at, uh, at extending some of the uh, life of natural gas plants, but you're also seeing uh, ways in which we decarbonize um, these natural gas plants and so that they can actually provide essential services to provide resiliency and backup power for the grid, which as we know has been quite essential uh, as the climate continues to change. And so when you think about the ways in which the Department of Energy is supporting hydrogen, we have a hydrogen office, we have the um, you know, Earthshot initiative where the first applications are due on uh, July 7th. And then we have the loan programs office that is absolutely supporting um, uh, many of the commercial applications. I think when it comes to Houston and the extraordinary work that people are doing in Houston, I think there is a huge amount of um, there's a huge amount of supply chain that we have to talk through, right? So it's not just around the production of gray hydrogen and converting that into blue hydrogen or pink hydrogen from nuclear power or uh, green hydrogen from electrolyzers. I think we're also talking about exports of hydrogen to important applications around the world. I think we're talking about uh, turning that hydrogen into essential uh, chemicals like methanol, where you know many uh, maritime organizations and ships have now decided that methanol is a, a primary pathway by which they want to decarbonize their supply chain to meet the international maritime organization's requirements around moving away from, um, from tar and from other unhealthy fuel burning. Um, and then I think when you think about 
uh, other applications like ammonia, um, you know, we import ammonia into this country. We are only the fifth largest uh, producer of ammonia in the world. And so as the president continues to uh, beat the drum of bringing back jobs into this country and reindustrializing our country here, uh, I think hydrogen plays an essential role in, in that as well. So with that, I, what I would say is that the Department of Energy is all in. We're all in on making sure that we produce the jobs here. We're all in on making sure that the expertise in the oil industry, the natural gas industry, in many of our energy industries is used to be part of this decarbonization vision. I think there are many folks who believe that as we modernize our economy, and create less carbon, that this is going to be uh, a place where we are gonna create winners and losers. And while that may happen in isolated uh, cases, the vast majority of our workers uh, will be needed. Their expertise will be needed in the future economy. And so we're committed to figuring out how we actually inspire the corporations that they work for, as well as the workers themselves to think big, think bigger about what your technology can be used for, what technology we have at the Department of Energy that can be licensed and commercialized by your companies, and how we might partner with the public sector, including the Port of Houston, the city, uh, the surrounding areas, to make sure that a lot of this infrastructure can be built using a public-private partnership, not only using the grants that the Congresswoman talked about, but also using loan products, guarantee products, and other products to make sure that all of this infrastructure gets decarbonized in a way that's cost-effective, but also in a way that creates wealth for you know, entrepreneurs and corporations alike across the entire spectrum. And so as we continue to show American leadership, I think hydrogen is going to be a place uh, that's very important. One last point I wanted to make is that incubators are very important. And when you look at the incubators that are already in Houston, they play an extraordinary role in making sure that it's not just large corporations that lead in this area, but it's also entrepreneurs who have fantastic ideas that are supported. And those ideas, and with that support, we're actually making sure that, that we continue to create this job creation, and in some cases, disruption into our industry so that we're remaining on the cutting edge of both technology and the economy. And so with that, I wanna thank everybody for their participation in this event, but thank everybody for their aggressive work in the energy transition. This is not gonna be an easy thing to do, but it requires the best, the smartest people to actually spend time thinking about what is the right way to do this? What is the right way to engage government? How do we make sure that the government is spending money in ways that are supporting your efforts and not so not just putting money into uh, ideas that may have been tried in the past, but um, but have not you know resulted in the outcomes that we want. So we want your feedback, and we want to make sure that what you're doing is actually being watched and 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 heard in all of the decisions that we're making. So please engage, please participate in the programs that we have, and understand that the technology really is there. What we're doing is unlocking the learning curve. That yes, hydrogen may be at six, seven dollars a kilogram from uh, electrolyzers today. It may be at three or four dollars a kilogram from blue hydrogen approaches today. But as we deploy technology, just like we did in solar, wind, lithium ion batteries, and electric vehicles, that we are going to unlock trillion dollar markets and we will achieve cost parity, which will then uh, be a be technology that we can export to create wealth around the world. With that, thank you so much for your time. And I look forward to hearing from all of you. Well, thanks, Jigger. Thanks for those great comments. As Jigger just mentioned just a few weeks ago, the Department of Energy released its Earthshot Initiative, a program to establish big audacious goals to address climate change through technology and innovation. And one of the first of the Earthshots will focus on hydrogen. DOE has asked for information on which regions around the country will be the best place for hydrogen demonstration projects. During this conference, we developed a vision for what a hydrogen economy might look like and why Houston should be the logical place to succeed as a low carbon hydrogen cluster. This is the vision we're calling H2 Houston Hub. 
If you're interested in helping us create that vision, please join us by supporting our comments to the Department of Energy. You can do so by reading our comments on our website and by signing up there. Here's the URL. It will take us all of us working together to make this happen. The center looks forward to working with you to do just that. So before we close today, I'd like to circle back to the themes in the Greater Houston Partnerships strategy, which we heard during the three days of our conference. First, the global climate challenge is real, it's urgent, and we believe Houston is committing to addressing it. At the same time, the global challenge of producing more energy for a growing population is also real and urgent. And there's nothing about this dual challenge or solution that's gonna be easy. It will require significant public and private investment to decarbonize the incumbent industry as well as to develop, deploy, and scale new technologies. It will requ require aggressive public policy support, and it will require all of us making changes in the way we do business and live our, live our lives. The Houston Energy Transition Initiative unveiled on Tuesday is focused on the enormous opportunity to grow Houston's economy, to create jobs, and to deliver value to shareholders in a low carbon energy future. And developing Houston's new low carbon hydrogen economy is part of that way forward. And finally, if you'd like to stick around for about 20 minutes, we've created two breakout rooms where you can meet some of those attending today's conference and continue the discussion. You can find links to each of the breakout rooms under the networking and virtual roundtable section on the agenda tab. Just select which of the discussions you'd like to participate in. Uh, you will leave the Whova platform and join by Zoom. So thank you again for joining us for the Future of Global Energy Conference. And look for, uh, we look for us in a couple weeks at our Energy and Climate webcast on July 27th with nationally known Boston University energy expert, Peter Fox Pinner. Look forward to seeing you then.